Hello, I'm Gareth. And I'm Shane. And welcome to Building Business Resilience. This is a podcast from Sanctuary Financial Planning, which helps growth business owners and social media influencers achieve financial independence. We're two passionate financial planners on a mission to seek out new ideas, tips and tricks to help you take control of your finances and run better businesses. We delve into the true goals and aspirations of our guests in order to provide you with some real value and positivity. Nothing outrageous, clear, simple, solid financial solutions. We also have a YouTube series to accompany this and details will be at the end of the show. So let's move on to our guest. Welcome back. It's episode eight of the Building Business Resilience Show. In today's episode, we're talking to Laura James of Iniquity Marketing. So a little bit about Laura. Following a career immersed in financial services marketing at Lloyd's, AXA, and the Bath Executive MBA scheme, Laura's built specialist expertise and a formidable reputation for a consultative work in the financial sector. Supporting ambitious businesses in strategy, marketing, and branding, Laura founded Uniquity in 2016 to provide maximum marketing support at a manageable cost. Uniquity is on a mission to build better financial services brands that reach the customer that matter. In turn, they empower financial service professionals and their clients to achieve the success they deserve. A proven performer and engaging high net worth clients and building online propositions. Today, Laura leads a cross-purpose team in offering a complete marketing solution for your business. So without much further ado, let's get started. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? Yeah, we're good. We're still uh, still battling on. What are we? Week eight? Week eight in the Big Brother house? You're longer than that, Shane, aren't you? Yeah, I think I think anyone that will listen, will listen to these podcasts will be bored of me adding an extra two weeks every time to this due to my uh, injury uh, that was um, inflicted by a previous um, uh, guest. But well, let's not go into that. I'll try not to do the same today. <laughs> <laughs> So how are you keeping law? How how is business, et cetera, in this uh, climate? Yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, I think we've been really lucky. We have quite a lot of retainer clients and they've kept us really busy. Um, and we've had quite a few new clients coming in and doing different stuff. So we're definitely seeing a change in the activity that our clients are doing, but it's definitely more activity rather than less if that makes sense what sort of changes are they doing then in the way that they're, they're operating the brands themselves or i think the most obvious thing and like it's totally obvious because i think i think the statistic is that kind of apps and online activity and social media engagement are up in the region of 20 percent. so you know people are using more stuff online and obviously we can't go anywhere so you can't do yeah. events and things like that so Digital activity is hugely, hugely up um, in all ways. And the one thing I've seen, which is what you guys are doing as well, is some brands are just kind of grabbing hold of this and taking the opportunity to innovate. And we've definitely had clients where we've been talking to them for a long time about video and social media. But this has been the catalyst to kind of help them make that jump. So I, I guess that's definitely the biggest thing, the increase in digital channels. Are you saying then there was a lot of people that were on the fence or ready to jump to do these type of things, but the, the, the fear factor prevented them for a long time. And because of you know, what has happened, everyone then was told or was made to, 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 to advance what they were planning to do maybe next year, the year after, or they had to be pushed and it was the, the opportune time to bring these things out now. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely two elements to that. I think there is the fear factor in terms of, oh, I'm going to be on video and, you know, are we ready yeah. for that and all of those sorts of things. And I think this environment has kind of made the kind of rough and ready video in your in your house completely okay, whereas before, you know, that wasn't always um, the way brands wanted to present themselves. And so it's allowed the opportunity and people are just trying new things. The other thing is that just the channels that they were using, which might have been face-to-face -face networking and events and, you know, just meeting with clients, those channels aren't available. So you have to do something else. And definitely like webinars have, you know, hugely increased with our clients in that sense because they can't do those face-to-face -face meetings that they were doing. Yeah. It's your comfort zone, isn't it? And thinking of not what you think is best for you, but how will how will you engage people in a certain age group? As an example, I was speaking to a friend of mine today who works and does mortgages um, in different parts of the country, and he's in his late 50s. 
um, he doesn't didn't grasp the concept of doing anything digital or anything because um, I think he, we found out it was him that had the issue with it. And I said, well, yeah, but most of the people with mortgages maybe would be in the 20s, 30s and 40s. And they're probably the people that are more so into apps, podcasts and stuff like that. So sometimes it probably is the mentality of the individual rather than um, looking at the bigger picture of going towards the, the group of people that you're looking to um, access. Yeah, that's true. And I think, you know, I think the great brands are asking, how can I help my customers and how can I help my clients? And it's just thinking about who they are and where are they? And at the moment, everyone's online. So you kind of like, you have to be there. I'm also seeing some people who aren't doing anything and are staying the same. And I think that there's going to be, you know, those two types of brands who are doing things very differently are going to have very different outcomes in the long term, because even when lockdown eases it's going to be a long time um, before everything returns to normal or I think this kind of these people are getting so used to your calls and webinars and everything else that you know that's going to become the new normal I, I, I get it some situations you know family situations don't lend itself to being able to do some of these things and maybe learn and do other things but you know we've all got kids the three of us you know we're all managing to do it I think I think sometimes that can be a bit of an excuse but I think it's the time to like push on and do it. But I guess some people don't have that mentality, do they? Do you know, I have a kind of like rounded view about that. There is people who are kind of burying their head in the sands. But I also think we have to allow that this time of lockdown is like incredibly challenging yeah. from a mental health point of view. You know, everyone's going, oh, take this opportunity to write a book and take this opportunity to start your new podcast. Some people just are, are like only being able to kind of manage the day to day and move on from that. I think there is some brands who are ready to kind of embrace this and move forward, but there's kind of lots of other elements that mean that people may not be able to take the jump at this time. Yeah. Yeah. As you say, survival is probably key for most people Mm. at the moment and and anything about that is a, is a bonus. Definitely. But I think the brands who are embracing this and are able to innovate are going to come out of this incredibly well. And I think the brands I see doing it well are the ones who's going, what can I do that is useful or entertaining yeah. So that's the kind of content that's really interesting. I mean, look at Joe Wicks and his key lessons. You know, there's a, a personal brand who's just going to do amazingly out of this whole process because he's just providing content that's useful for thousands of people. Yeah, I think I say, I think where you're going to find a big increase is your YouTubes and your podcasters and things like that. The ones who are quite well drilled at it, they're going to they're going to clean up in this. You know, whether that's the right word, I don't know, but you know the the online engagement, the followers, subscribers, and probably people who never had the time before to go and watch these YouTube videos and watch these, listen to these podcasts and stuff are actually now finding the time and, and hope, and I, and I can imagine, and hopefully it will, it'll form part of their daily routine then as well. You know, like I've always listened to podcasts, you know, it's been, I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And I think the brands that will win are the ones who are helping the most people. And I think that's a nice way of thinking about it and thinking about your marketing. How is my marketing and how is my branding going to help more people? Laura, when you say brands, for the benefit of people listening to that, I presume you're not talking about Coca-Cola, Kellogg's and all these type of things. You're, a brand can be essentially a one-man business band as well. Yeah, absolutely. And an individual. We're all brands. Yeah. We all have our own personal brands. All of our companies have brands. It's probably because I work in marketing that I refer to brands all the time. Um, But yeah, I'm talking about it in the general sense of it being all of those different things. Yeah, you kind of get the idea that, you know, the the, the small business with, you know, 5, 10, 15 employees or whatever it may be, when they hear the word brand, they go, I'm not big enough to do that. But everyone, every business is a brand in itself, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, And there's that famous saying from Jeff Bezos, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Uh, your brand is what kind of how people talk about you and how people describe you. You know, Sanctuary is yeah. a brand and you're building your brand through the Building Business Resilience show. Yeah. So, And then you're building your individual personal brands as well. So, yeah, yeah. there's lots of different elements to it. So any, anything else that brands, let's, we'll use the word brands then going forward, that brands <laughs> should be doing in this? So Ogilvy, who are a really large marketing agency, put a kind of little post out on Instagram and they had three things that they thought people should be doing in this crisis, which I thought was really good. So the first one was how you're helping fight the coronavirus itself. So there's only like 
some people who can do content around that stuff but there is also you know like this show is helping get people to reach your clients on different subjects the second one is how you're helping other businesses and other people and the third one is critical information that people need during the crisis so for you as financial planners that might be getting out the latest information from the government on what support there is available but I think the key theme of all of those things is show don't tell show people what you're doing and how it's useful don't you know you know don't just say what you're doing any key uh, marketing skills companies need now oh well yeah i guess the obvious one is that we're moving to a more digital world and you have to have the capabilities to do that now there's two ways of doing that you can upskill yourself and teach yourself to do things or you can outsource Um, And probably individuals and companies need to make that assessment of what's going to be best for them in that space. But there is definitely a need to be doing that upskilling. And I just think the way that so because everything's changing so quickly, part of the marketing skill set is listening and understanding what's going on with your clients and in the marketplace and then reacting to that as well so there's almost like a discipline and how you plan and how you do marketing strategy that's changed as well has the marketing strategy for the world then changed because six months ago would somebody come to you and say thinking about this idea um i'd like to do this this and this the budget is this and and you might if they were a novice at all this you might have to hold their hand and do all of this but now people sat at home and um, budgets mightn't be there or may, may be there but people are winging it in most of the things that they're doing be it podcast uh, sending out flyers whatever sort of digital thing they're doing and they're just learning on the job more so because they have to because everything is evolving so quickly that you haven't got time to sit down and learn how to be an expert at one thing immediately you just have to to go with it yeah i think it's partly that i think probably the difference in how we work before you would probably sit down with a brand and they would have an objective like uh, we want to grow by x amount in this time period And then we would help them put a plan together to answer that objective and to work out what channels and marketing and everything else would help achieve that. And there would maybe like be a one year plan of how of what was going to happen at each of the times and everything else. Now we're seeing more companies come to us kind of like we were doing this. What do we do now? And you can't really plan for a year ahead. It's more like, well, what are we going to do in the next 30 days or 90 days and even when I'm planning in 90 day sections I'm still reviewing those plans so everything is just changing so much more quickly. Is that because in the past year you knew what was happening in the world but but we don't know if we're going to be able to be going out in 90 days and shaking people's hands and networking and chatting to people and so you have to do it in very small bite-sized micro chunks because you don't know what's going to happen there's no point in in um, setting a plan for the next 180 days, because um, if that's all you know, um, digital related, the world might have be, have opened up again. And so you have to, as you say, you have to look at it in, in bite-sized chunks. Absolutely. And I think especially at the beginning of lockdown, and I still think now we have to ask ourselves, looking at our existing marketing, is this still appropriate to send out? Because at the beginning and, and ongoing, people are uncertain and they're anxious and all of those sorts of things. You some you have to change the tone of some of the marketing to reflect that. And so yeah, it's just adapting everything and making sure it's relevant for the for the current environment. Yeah, yeah I think like we're 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 fond believers in sort of like a 90-day plan chain, aren't we? Um and trying to break that down. Like, I even like take it down to like weekly and then you can cut that weekly into daily as well. I think I think you've got to have a plan out there of what it is, but it, it's different now than what it would would have been because like you say like people would have planned 12 18 three years for that but i think you've got to scale it now like i say and, and take it down to virtually like a day by day thing you know yeah we do still like we will still have like a 90 day lay down with all of the activity in but what i'm finding is we're reviewing that much more often and maybe yeah. adapting it and the other reason for that is people are trying new things so they're trying like a new webinar or Uh, an online group zoom or you know podcasting whatever it may be and as they're getting feedback because all of that stuff is new we're adapting on going to the result of that as well so that's where the changes are coming because you're trying new things and doing new things isn't it using almost the analogy of the the pilot and the plane and you know Heathrow to to um new york you know where you're going you know how long it's going to take if you go from a to b um in a straight line 
but this virus has kicked in and now there's a few um, storms on the way. And yeah, we know that the flight path is going to be altered in some way, but the, 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 the end destination is still going to remain the same. It might take longer to get there, might have to go around a few things. You might have to do something different, but you're still going to go from A to B. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And actually, I've got a planning framework that well, it's actually a decision making framework that I'd love to share with you because this is kind of it's from um, a friend of mine who's a leadership consultant. Um, and when she shared it with me, I was like, oh, my goodness, this totally applies to marketing and is, you know, exactly what um, I'm experiencing. It's called the Kenevin Framework. Um, which is actually um, a Welsh word. I was going to say, I thought it was. Which means habitat or a sense of place. Um, And it's a framework for thinking about planning in complex environments. So the first part of the framework is if you're in a very simple environment, then you can kind of sense what's going on. You can take that information, categorize it, and then respond. So this is how, like, when everything is certain, a marketing plan, you can take the information, analyze it, put it into a plan and create a response. And it's easy to create best practice in that environment because you've got all of the information. Then when things start getting a bit more complicated, you have to do a little bit, you you can still sense what's going on, but you still, you have to do a little bit more um, analyzing before you respond. And as the environment gets more complicated, you get good practice, which means there might be slightly different views on what best practice is, depending on the expert, but they're kind of all going in the same direction. And this is probably where we were operating before COVID kind of came in. If the situation gets more complex than that, you have to kind of probe a bit more on what's actually happening in the environment. So you have to kind of listen to what's going on in social media. You have to get a sense of what's going on in the marketplace and and then respond. So it's difficult to create best practice or good practice that environment because you're having to look what's going on and then kind of emerge as a result. And when things get completely chaotic, there's almost like there isn't enough information to make a good decision on what best practices or good practices. So you have to act. So put something out there, then sense what the response is and then respond in practice. So it's much more agile, much more responsive. And from a marketing point of view, that's what I was talking about earlier. Before we would have kind of, we had the knowledge and we had the information and the best practice for me to know, oh, you need to achieve this well, this is what your marketing plan is. Now we're doing much more sensing, intuitive stuff, putting stuff out there in the market, responding to it. And that means we're planning on much, much shorter timeframes. And sometimes not even, you know, having a really long-term plan at all. But if you think about it, so many organizations are set up for this kind of long-term planning way of thinking. But the problem is, as soon as you put a plan together, things change. And I think that is going to be a challenge, especially for the larger organizations of how do they adapt to this kind of planning? Because everyone, you know, everyone wants a plan. Everyone wants something that's certain and nothing is certain. And so you have to adapt to that more uncertain environment. Does that mean then that the bigger companies, again, use another analogy of a boat, it's going to be harder for a bigger company or a bigger boat to turn quickly Whereas a, a smaller company will, will be able to adapt and make those changes a lot quicker because if there's more hierarchy in a, in a, in a larger business, it doesn't have to go through all this checking, compliance, marketing, all that. Whereas if they're smaller, are they able to adapt quicker and, and easier? Yeah, I think there's definitely, that's definitely true. I think there's another layer to it. The way that firms respond is so much to do with the culture of the organization. I've worked with very small businesses who have a very kind of staid, analytical, planned culture who find it difficult to turn around quickly. And I've worked with big companies who are very agile, able to make decisions are set up in that way. So I think generally, yes, it's harder for bigger companies because of that, that, that hierarchy and everything else, but it also has a lot to do with the attitudes of the people working in the company and the culture there. Are we okay? To, we, we can link to that, Laura, in our show notes. Is that all right? to the, yeah. the diary perhaps so anyone on podcast can can have a look at wh- what we were talking about perfect um biggest opportunities for growth then at the moment in your eyes so the biggest opportunities for growth i think the one thing is there isn't there's probably never been a better time to engage with clients because we're all anxious we're all worried we're all uncertain 
we're basically all in the same boat. And so in terms of engaging with clients and customers, there's never been a better time to pick up the phone and check in with people um, There's, you know, to create useful content. And I think that going back to that thing, just be helpful, like work out how can your brand really be helpful in this environment and that will be the opportunity. And obviously then using the digital channels that are available. And you know where they are because most more than likely they're going to be at home anyways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And people do have a little bit more time on their hands now. So I think engagement in webinars and that sort of thing is easier mm. to get people onto a webinar. Will it get to the stage you you you're looking now and a few comments have been made even this morning. I've looked on a on a Slack group that we're at that are people starting to get fed up with zoom and this that and the other was it novel eight nine weeks ago you know it wasn't just it was work related and now families are having you know zoom quizzes and catch up are people getting a bit fed up with with zoom at the moment should it be should something different be done or should you just keep doing things like that so yeah the zoom fatigue is real i've seen it in an article they proved it that it is if you're on zoom all day it can be incredibly draining and hard and all of those sorts of things so i think people are getting a bit fed up of it. One thing I've noticed that when we set up Uniquity three years ago, trying to get people on Zoom calls was like pulling teeth. Yeah. And like I'd end up having to call them instead because they didn't want to join a Zoom. Now it's like no problem. So I think people are getting used to it as well. And it's definitely going to be a medium going forward. I just think linked to their Zoom fatigue, it's like everyone's got to do that a little bit more for their own kind of self-care and you know managing your mindset and all of those sorts of things as well. Yeah, it, it, it is draining. Um, like this is my second Zoom meeting of today. My, my first one's only a short one, but it's quite it's quite interesting. I was just on just a quick call with the client, which went on 45 minutes in the end. And we, we were talking about uh, mental health and things like that in the end on it. Um, I, I don't know how we went from um, her finances to that. But um, like she was saying, she's concerned for some of her colleagues out there at the moment that they, they, they are kind of struggling with anxiety and stuff because they, they don't want to leave the house, you know, and I think there's a lot of that. And just go back to it, it is draining being on the calls, like kind of on the Zoom calls. I, I don't know whether you just need to concentrate that bit more. Maybe it is because you're in front of the screen as well. I, I think it's great and it's here to stay. I, I think there still is going to be that element of face-to-face needed because I think some of these courses online as well, I think it is nice to have that ability to break out into a coffee area rather than a breakout on a screen on a webinar which is what you're kind of saying, you know, um, my, my partner's doing um, financial planning qualifications now, and I think their course is going all online. And she said it would be great to actually have been at the course so you can actually break out and chat to the person next to you, you know, and so like, yeah. you just don't have that now. Is there a guilt, though, when you're on, when you're on courses like that, that, you know, if you have family, you're, you're on the course, they say have a 15 minute break you're going out you're you know you're putting the washing on or you're putting some some clothes away or you have to go out and say hello to the little ones and then when you finish at five o'clock you know it is almost down tools and it is i switched off from the the the, 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 the zoom meeting for the last seven hours 30 seconds ago and now you have to go into parent mode and you have to get the dinner ready and all that whereas if you're away there is the the difference in the downtime between leaving let's go for a drink let's dissect the day and all of that there isn't in that zoom call so i can get the idea of of the fatigue and then you know you're going on about mental health and there seems to be an underlying theme the all of the podcasts i think are the vast majority that we've done we brought that subject up that uh, and uh, we talked earlier about it, Laura, of, you know, this is the norm and, and, and actually people be doing more things, but mental health is the, the biggest thing in this. It's, it's trying to remain positive for the majority of the time with this while still running businesses or being employed um, and still doing all of the other tasks that are uh, needed in the house with kids at home and trying to keep everyone happy. It's a, it's a draining time um, for everyone. And I think, what it represents is change. This has changed our, our lives, whether we've liked it or not. And change is hard yeah. and change is draining. And you do have to manage yourself when you're going through heavy periods of change. But I think there isn't almost enough awareness around how difficult change is. And there isn't enough awareness of the kind of tools and tips that you can use to manage yourself through that. Last thing, I've wrote it up here. What are the top three actions you think businesses should be uh, taking right now? So I think the first one we've touched on, it's changing the way that you're planning. So forget having a one-year plan and everything you know, really scripted and specific. 
you need to design your plan to be agile. You need to be having regular check-ins. You need to be having an even closer eye on your measurement and statistics and listening to what's going on to make sure you're adapting ongoing. The second thing I would say is the digital skill set. Work out what digital skills you're going to need and either upskill or outsource. There's some brilliant places where you can learn online like Digital Marketeer and Udemy. And Mm. there is also some brilliant outsourcing companies that you can work with too. But it's just having a smart way of assessing what you outsource and what you upskill on. And I think the final thing for me, um, and this is because, you know, I really believe in brands and the power of brands, but being really clear on what your brand values are and using this period to get super, super clear on that. Because um, I think there's Harvard Business Review said something like 64% of um, consumers would cite shared values as their reasons for purchasing a certain brand values are really, really important. And if you're really clear on what your brand values are, you can use them in every single piece of work that you do. So when we work with brands, we often talk about the three words and we'll define three words that are associated with that brand. And then we use those three words across everything they do, whether it's a podcast, a blog or everything else. So keeping that brand consistency while doing all of these kind of new things and different channels is really important too. So that was a great chat with Laura. There's some great key takeaways from the episode as usual. We will link to how to contact Laura in the show notes. Head over to our website, www.sanfp.co.uk or check our YouTube channel, search Sanctuary Financial Planning in YouTube for more information and insights. That's it for this episode. Next, we're talking all things business and Olympics with Jamie Bulch. You can hear that wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, don't forget to click and subscribe to get all the latest episodes as soon as they arrive. Until next time, thanks for listening. (laughs) 